Please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy again, chapter 3. I want to thank the, um, the worship team. I got to know them a little bit. Uh, they do look pretty cool, <laughs> but they honor the Lord, and um, I so appreciate that such a gift. Also the privilege to be able to just be among such fine people and, and fine preachers. It's always very humbling. Um, walked out of the green room. I had a pretty rough l night last night again. And I thought, I feel like I'm going to pass out. And uh, I walked through the back and Vody Bacham sitting in a chair bent over with a big ice pack on his eye, and I thought, man, we're getting old. <laughs> we are really getting old. Someone asked me how I felt, and I said, well, imagine five days in a stagnant swamp wrestling with Vody Bauckham. <laughs> That's how I have felt. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. But the spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you are and everything that you have done for us. Thank you for your word, without which, Lord, we would not have much of an anchor. Lord, please help us to understand this text and to apply it to our lives for your glory and our good, the good of your church. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to just summarize what was said in, the, in my last sermon, verses 14 and 15. First of all, again, I want to plead especially with the young believers here that you must become a vital member of a local church. You must. It is not an option in Scripture. You will never be in the center of God's will unless you put yourself in a local church with biblical elders who are seeking to follow sola scriptura, who are simple men simply seeking to obey God in what is written. We see in verse 15 one of the most, I think, amazing passages for the local church, one of the most amazing passages with regard to our need of the day. And it says this, 
In verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. It is his church, his household. And the only way we can know how to conduct ourselves or to manage as ministers as stewards, the bride of Christ is through what is written. And I just want to say this to you. I don't care how offensive it is to you. May I have grace, but may the zeal of the Lord also push me into saying this. If you go beyond what is written and follow your own cleverness, I can only say to you that your arrogance is overwhelming and I fear for your soul. Do you not know that you will stand before God on that great day? Do you not realize that in all of us something will burn and only that which is according to what is written will last. On that, deal, on, on that day, zeal will not matter. The amount of effort you put forth, you just put forth effort into your own arrogance unless you are submitting as a minister of Christ to what is written. And my dear brother, listen to me. Is there not enough written in the Scriptures to keep us busy all day long so that we do not occupy ourselves in futile and stupid things that are nothing more than the vain, vanity, foolishness of men? God never asked for your cleverness. He never wanted your inventions. You are a steward, and as a steward, you are called upon to do simply this, obey the directions that have been left to you, not through some ecstatic vision, but through what is written. Not through some wild prompting in your heart, but through what is written. That's what this text is about. Now, having gone through that, we come to verse 16. By common confession, Great is the mystery of godliness. ESV has it, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. The New English translation, we all agree. That body of genuine Christians throughout history confess this, that there is a mystery, and that mystery is great above all other mysteries. It is the one thing that captivates the heart of a man and will not let him go. Now what is a mystery? As Dr. D.A. Carson set forth the other day, a mystery is a truth that was previously hidden but has now been revealed. It's interesting that in the uh, Qumran documents and also in Jewish apocalyptic writings, that we see that they believed that the mystery was the secret plan of God that would be revealed in the last days, and some of them through the coming of the Messiah. And Paul says that time has come. That great mystery has been given to the church, and it has been given to us the greatest of all truth, the greatest of all mysteries, far beyond anything that can be seen or spied or discovered in the universe. The greatest thing has been given to us. And when Paul says this, he says, by common confession, great is this mystery of godliness. It's a difficult passage. Is he talking about great is the mystery of our religion? That's a great possibility. This thing called Christianity, there is one great mystery that should captivate our heart and take first place always. But he could also be saying that this great mystery leads us to true piety, to true conformity to the heart and the will of God. 
the will of God. Now, what is that? He sets it forth. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in glory, taken up in the world, in glory. Believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now, many people believe that Paul is borrowing here from a Christian hymn. It is possible, but because it's in this book, I know that it is inspired and it is true. Now, scholars look at this and sometimes they, they divide it into two stanzas. Each stanza has three lines. The first stanza, he was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels. The second stanza would be proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, let's just look at these briefly. Even though, let me assure you, the greatest minds that have ever been, whether human or angelic, could never comprehend all the glory, the beauty, and the power found in this hymn. The greatest voice among men, angels, seraphs, even if they could grasp this, could not communicate fully the beauty of it. I am convinced that the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is this mystery, is so great that only the fullness of its greatness can be comprehended by God himself. And that it is our task, the moment we are born again, the moment we believe we have eternal life, and this is eternal life, to know him. So the moment we believe, we start a pursuit, a chase, a wild search that will go on throughout all eternity. Sometimes students and people will talk to me about the second coming and the book of Revelation and as though it was the greatest of all truths. I like to tell them this. I said, you'll understand everything about the second coming on the day it happens. But you will be an eternity of eternities in heaven and you still will not have reached the foothills of the Everest of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a farm boy. I am not greatly educated, nor am I well cultured. You can take me out of the farm, but you can't take the farm out of me. When I was in school, and my school was a rather poor school, they were trying to give us a class called Art Appreciation. And what our professor told us was, you have to develop a mind that can appreciate beauty. And later on, you know, at times, after I left our cattle ranch, and I learned that there were other things other than meat, <laughs> my wife would make me eat all sorts of strange things. And she said, you have to develop a palate to appreciate finer things. I believe that we are born again quite uncultured. And I believe that it is the task of the preacher to cultivate the mind of the flock and to give them a palate so that they learn to reject the slop the common, and they learn to appreciate what is truly beauty. That they learn to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that is the purpose of the preacher in that he, he spends long hours every day locked in a room alone with God and the Word that he may pull forth at least something of the great infinite truth locked in this book about God and teach the people so that the people can appreciate, 
appreciate that which is true. And that's why I'm so burdened for what calls itself Christianity in America because many of the pastors are entertaining people with fodder, with the carnal, and in some cases even with the demonic. Here in these words is life, beauty, and the manifestation of the glory of God, He who was revealed in the flesh. You see, you can't understand how powerful this phrase is unless you understand who he was prior to his incarnation and what it meant for the Son of God to take upon himself a body in the likeness of human flesh and then to wade through this world for the sake of his bride. I was preaching last week in California and I had to preach on Ephesians 2. One, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And the only way I can commu could communicate what that text is really saying is this. Imagine yourself as a dead and rotting corpse laying at the bottom of a cesspool. A cesspool that was created by the refuse and the rot flowing out of your own body. So here you are, dead in your trespasses and sins, in the realm of all your transgressions, in the realm of all your transgressions and sins. And in the incarnation, the Son of God comes and wades that cesspool. And then on Calvary, he dives in headfirst after his bride. He takes her in his arms, as filthy as she is, and he pulls her out of that cesspool. And he cleanses her with his blood. And he puts his mouth on her mouth and breathes life into her. You see, there is enough power in just this to propel a regenerated heart throughout an et in, into an eternity of piety. He was vindicated in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, in a sense, during his ministry, he was vindicated in the Spirit, in that the Spirit was with him, doing marvelous works no man has ever done, vindicating him, the works that I do, he says. If you don't believe me, look at the works. But primarily the idea here is the resurrection. And we see that, don't we? Listen to Romans 1.4. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. It doesn't mean he became the Son of God, but he was declared to be. He was proven to be. If you're waiting for God to open up the sky to speak to you with regard to the validity of Christ and his death, then you'll wait in vain. God's already spoken. He, he raised him from the dead. And that's the only evidence he's ever going to give you. And it is enough. Romans 4.25, he was raised because of our justification. Now many people will look at this and they get kind of confused and they say, well, the death is the important thing, but here it skips that. No, it doesn't. You see, you're not raised from the dead unless you're actually dead. And then the word vindication is so very, very important. You see, the, the raising of Christ from the dead by the Spirit of God is the great evidence that his death had meaning. And what was that meaning? It all comes down to this. Every time I present the gospel, I begin with this. The greatest problem in all the world is if God is just, he cannot forgive you. That is the great dilemma of Scripture. All of Scripture is geared toward answering this one question. If God is just, how can he forgive wicked men and still be just? And the answer is found in the death of his son on Calvary, where he bore the sin of his people. He bore his bride's sin. And then all the wrath of God against her was poured out on him. And through his suffering and death, the offended justice of God was satisfied 
and wrath was appeased. If that's not in your gospel, you don't preach the gospel. You do not preach the gospel. He was seen by angels. What is the meaning of that? Well, we know that angels were there at his birth. We know that angels comforted him before, during Gethsemane. We know he could have called legions of angels to come down and help him. We know that angels announced his resurrection. But I think this goes much farther than this. It's talking about the universal or cosmic significance of Christ's work. What stupid men ignore and cannot appreciate the highest created beings in the universe stretch forth their neck to constantly gaze upon. This to them is the wonder of wonders. Then he goes to the next stanza. Proclaimed among the nations. It's the gospel's global proclamation. You know, Paul, even in Paul's time, he told Festus, this wasn't done in a corner. And then he goes on and he says this, believed on in the world. The power of the gospel, the power of the gospel to advance God's redemptive plan of the ages. God is not losing. You see, you've got to be very, very careful that you do not judge everything from the microcosm in which you live. If I go to almost every country in the world, Christianity is a minority. But if you add up all the people who know Christ, scattered throughout all the world, I can assure you that Christ's enterprise is the biggest thing on this planet. I am not discouraged. He rolls on and rolls on triumphantly. He does. And this gospel is powerful. I know, brethren, I know that if I shed all of Saul's armor and I stand before the world or a tribe or the Bedouins in the Middle East and I have nothing in my hand except the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I know if I preach long enough, someone's coming out of there converted. And then finally, he says, taken up in glory, Christ's present triumphal reign through the gospel. He ends in glory. It all ends in glory. It all ends in glory. If you've read the scriptures correctly as a man of God, there should be times in your life, brethren, where your wife will catch you in your office or seated outside on a chair. She takes one look at you and she knows. She's lost you. You're gazing. You're looking. You're waiting. You're longing for the glory that will appear when he appears. Sometimes you cannot preach too much on heaven. You can preach about heaven wrongly. But brothers, you need to have constantly before you this is not a losing venture. This is a glorious cause. The greatest thing that has ever been done. And we're a part of it. And it's wonderful. And it's all rolled up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I've gone places to preach and the preacher will say, what are you going to preach on? Uh, the gospel. And he said, well, this isn't an evangelistic meeting. I've even had people say, well, we know that. Really? 
Well, there's your problem. <laughs> Let's go on to verse 1 of chapter 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, what is going on here? First of all, Paul says, the Spirit explicitly says, you and I can be guided by the Spirit, we can be prompted, but you and I, we do, this type of language does not belong to us. But as an apostle, Paul could say this, the Spirit was explicitly saying, retos means expressedly, or, or very specifically the Spirit was saying. Also the word saying, lego is in present tense. The idea is that the Spirit was warning Paul over and over and over and over. About what? That in the latter times something horrible was going to happen. Now, when did the latter times begin? They did not begin with some revival in the 50s. The latter times began with the coming, the death, the resurrection, the ascension and exaltation of the Messiah. And how long will these latter days last until he returns? So throughout the entire age of the church, if we could say it that way, there is a constant and continuous danger of apostasy. Now, what is apostasy? Aphistimi means to remove oneself, to depart, to desert, to revolt. Now, in the context of Christianity, it is to depart from the faith or to stand, now listen to this, to stand aloof from the primary or central doctrines of the faith. Now, in this context, it is specifically directed toward our relationship with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, chapter 4 wasn't chapter 4 when Paul wrote it. It just simply followed his presentation in verse 16 of the gospel. It is falling away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, before we go on to talk about true apostasy, I want to be very careful here because when we can be in error about some things and without having committed apostasy, and yet at the same time, knowing my own heart, something about the human heart from the reading of the scriptures, I do know that there can be types and kinds and degrees, degrees of apostasy in our hearts. There can be a doctrinal apostasy. You know, we, we talk about the Great Reformation, and, and brothers, I study the Reformers and everything, but be very, very careful. The Reformers didn't see them as reformed, see themselves as reformed. They just wanted to be biblical. And I would really appreciate it if we would use the term biblical to define ourselves rather than just using the word deform, uh, reformed. <laughs> I honestly did not mean to do that. <laughs> Whatever happened to the word biblical? I just want to be biblical. You see? Now, so you can depart from doctrine, but there's ethical departures also, and we seem to forget that. Especially the young reformed movement and all these characters. It's like they think that having come to understand sovereign grace, they can now live a life of basic antinomianism or flaunting all their liberties and care not whether they offend another brother. They're little boys playing, diamond, playing marbles with diamonds is what they are. Then there can be a devotional apostasy. There really can. Sometimes I have to ask myself, Paul, how much time do you spend worshiping? Praying just for communion's sake, to delight in the Lord. And then there can be a practical apostasy. I was with a group of men 
and they, it was a meeting, it was several meetings, and it was all about the Reformation, and finally I just felt like out of love I needed to speak. And I said, you, you men are not reformed. How dare you say that? I said, well, because it's true, you're not reformed. You have one doctrine of the Reformation. You all have come to believe in the sovereignty of God and salvation. Congratulations. I applaud that, but that is not what the Reformation was about. The Reformation was about knowing the Scriptures and conforming every aspect of our life to the Scriptures. Do you see that? So there can be a practical one. Or I may go into your church, and before I preach, I walk into the library, and I see all kinds of books. I mean, I see the old guys who are really good. I see Flavel. I see Edwards. I see Calvin. I see all the, the newer guys. I see Sproul and MacArthur and everything else. And yet when I go in your church, nothing that is in those books is actually being practiced. The gospel presentation, well, I would think you were just run-of-the-mill evangelical, especially when you give the call to men to be saved. And so you can see, you can have it all in your head, but if it doesn't work itself out in the practical, it really doesn't matter that much. Now, he says, where will this, what will be the origin of this apostasy? He says, deceitful spirits, planos. The word actually at the beginning came to mean a, a wanderer or a vagabond, really. And then from that, it came to mean something of a deceiver or a seducer or an imposter, someone who kind of walked around from town to town, posing to be something he's not, deceiving people, lying to people. Paul may have been using this with regard to all those traveling teachers that were causing him so much trouble. Now. He says, doctrines of demons. This is doctrines of the devil's agents, because the devil's never referred to as a demon, but they are agents of the devil, and we know all about this, don't we? Look at 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, I've heard people say, he's a roaring lion, uh, really, I've heard this. He's a roaring lion, and lions that roared, it meant they didn't have any teeth, and so he's really scary, but he really can't do that much damage. That's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. I have personally seen the damage he has done in the last 33 years to brothers who started the race with me and are no longer there. And I fear what he could do to me. I am always asking the Lord this, increase the fear of the Lord in me. Increase the fear of sin in me. And a healthy fear of this devil. I have had men attack me with such viciousness that it was terrifying. It's like, do you realize that without God's protective care in one second, the devil could destroy everything about you. Ruin your reputation, absolutely destroy you. Have you ever looked down his mouth? It's terrifying. How does he devour? John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him and whenever he speaks, a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He lies. He's a liar. He is exceptional. He is brilliant in his evil. Absolutely brilliant. And the only thing that stands between the destructive power of his lies and the bride of Christ is the spouse of Christ, the king. That's why you do never want to run very far from him. Now the means, 
are instruments of apostasy. Look at verse 2. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. You need to understand something. I don't want to exalt my place or exalt the place of a preacher. But I want to tell you something. As God uses men to advance his kingdom through the proclamation of the truth, so the devil uses men to advance his cause against the kingdom of Christ. Now I want, to, I want you to notice something from the book of Acts, that whenever the kingdom is advancing, it's because the word of God is being proclaimed. You want to advance the kingdom? Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the truth. But you need to understand that there are two lines on this battlefield, and one line has men of truth. They are men of truth, not by their own virtue or merit, but the election, the sovereignty, the grace of God. They are men of truth, and they must stand with the truth and stop playing games like little boys and devote themselves to know the truth and to proclaim it. And then on this side, there is another line, and they are the proclaimers of lies frivolity, maybe even good things, but not the best things of God. Now, it says that they're liars because they do not speak the truth. Now, what does that mean? They do not speak according to what is written, and therefore they prove that they have no dawn. Young man, when you get up in the pulpit, no one needs to hear from your heart. They need to hear from God's word. If you go on the mission field, let me share with you something. Someone called me years ago and said, I want to come to the mission field. And I said, why? I just want to give my life away. I said, young man, no one here in Peru needs your life. They need the word of God proclaimed to them. Liars. They are liars because they do, not they do not speak according to what is written. They are hypocritical because they pretend to have a spirituality that is from God, but in actuality, at best, their spirituality is carnal or natural, and at worst, it's demonic. Now, again, how do you know if one's spirituality is from God? Because it conforms to what is written. It conforms to what is written. Then it says, seared in their own conscience, as with a branding iron. I believe this can, mean two, this can manifest itself in two different ways. First of all, they know they're lying. They know they're lying. But their conscience is so seared that they no longer believe in God or they no longer fear Him. Now, this idea of a conscience seared with a branding iron, when I was on our on our on our farm, when I was a little boy, we used to dehorn cattle by taking these big cutters and just cutting off the horn. And it was dangerous because it was dangerous for the cattle because blood would spurt and then there was chance of infection and everything else. And it hurt. But later on, what we did is new technology. When a calf was born, we'd bring it in after a certain amount of months, and we had this iron electric iron with a hole in it and you would lay it on the nub of that horn and you would go down and go down and it would hurt at first and then all of a sudden the animal would get still because what are you doing you're burning that horn off but you're also burning every one of those nerves so they no longer fear they no longer feel anything that's what it means now they know they're lying but there's another way I think they actually believe they're doing the right thing well, how did they get to this point? They looked at Scripture, and particularly, they looked at the Gospel and found little delight in it, little power in it, little usefulness of it for their ministries. And therefore, God turned them over, and the best word I can use here is to frivolity, to vanity. 
and churches throughout America that are called evangelical, and that's why that term means absolutely nothing today. Churches all throughout America, evangelical churches, are filled with this kind of frivolity. Now, I want us to look at verses three through five. Three through five totally catch me off guard. In light of verses one and two, I just do not expect three through five. And someone says, why? Well, if you look at verses one and two, I mean, he is using language that's not used anywhere else in the scriptures. He said, the Spirit explicitly says. That's like, hey, listen, this is important. And then he goes on and he talks about deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons and he talks about men filled with hypocrisy who are liars and are literally seared in their own conscience and you begin to think surely verse 3 is going to talk about the revelation of the Antichrist. I mean something big is coming in verse 3 but what do we get? Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. And then we look at that, especially as Americans, and go, well, we have no fear of apostasy. We all marry, and I've looked at most of you. You definitely don't abstain from food. <laughs> you need to abstain a little bit more, actually, to be biblical. So I didn't want you to think that I was getting too nice. So how, what does this have to do? I mean, how do you put these two things together? They don't make sense. But if you sit there long enough and look at it, you see, wow, I am so in danger of apostasy. The church is so filled, or not the church, but the expression of Christianity in America is so filled with apostasy. What is this saying? I mean, what does it really, really mean? What he's saying is this. Anytime you put anything in front of the gospel of Jesus Christ, anytime you place something higher, you give more emphasis to something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are committing apostasy at least to some degree, to some kind. Let me give you an example. There are churches that can set above the gospel a certain type of morality or legalism. They're all about rules. Then there, you know, I, I homeschool and I love homeschoolers and homeschool movements, but sometimes I've gone in to do conferences, and it, 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 honestly, it looks more like a Pride and Prejudice movie than it does Christianity. It's all about the way you dress, and it's all about the way you talk, and it's all about doing calligraphy, and it's all about, what? No. I had a pastor who called me one time, and he said, I want you to come preach in my church, because I think we got a lot of lost people in the membership. And I said, well, maybe I ought to preach to you if you've got a lot of lost people in the membership. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, man, my church has got a lot of homeschoolers. And I go, brother, I homeschool. You homeschool. So what are you saying? He goes, I got people in my church that if you ask them to stand up and give their testimony, they'll say, five years ago, I found homeschooling. What's happening there? The gospel is being put down and something else is being given importance. What do you talk about most? Preacher, what do you preach about most? I've been accused sometimes of only having one sermon. All I ever do is go to Romans 3 and teach on propitiation. I said, yeah, and I've read hundreds, maybe thousands of Spurgeon sermons, and if he took some obscure text anywhere in the Bible, he made it back to propitiation. As a matter of fact, in my study of all the great preachers down through the centuries, their great emphasis was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed. They couldn't get away from it because it captivated them. So if they talked about marriage, they talked about the cross. We can degrade 
and we can be turn, we can take legalism and we can put it above the gospel. At the same time, and this is more prevalent, we can take antinomianism, our freedoms, and put them above the gospel. The reason I can't enter into some of the freedoms of my younger brothers is because of the gospel. As a matter of fact, look what Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Paul said in Galatians 5, 13, for you were, not call, you were called to freedom, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Blessed is the man who meditates upon the law of God. Every time it seems I talk about commands or I talk about my delight in the law of God, people, I mean, people in the church will say to me things like, well, you know, the law is just oppressive. And this is what I always ask them. Just which law is oppressing you? Is it the one that says you shall not take your neighbor's wife? Is that the one oppressing you? Then you got some serious problems. Is it the one that says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor? Is that the one that oppresses you and makes you feel like you have no freedom? No, we are not saved by the law, our ability to keep commands. No, no, no. We're saved through believing. And even that believing is a gift from God. And yet those of us with a regenerate heart, we delight in the law of the Lord. And it is the law of God, the commands of God, that enable us to know how to express love towards God. Another way is to trivialize the gospel with material prosperity and self-realization. Most, a lot of pastors today call themselves life coaches. I applaud that. I want them to stop using the word pastor because they're not. <laughs> it's like when someone told me a while back, aren't you kind of angry that all these churches are taking Baptist off their, off their uh, you know, signs and stuff? And I said, no, I'm glad they're not Baptist. Self-realization? Prosperity? Brothers, I literally have to restrain myself when I hear somebody say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, and then point to their Mercedes. The Lord will provide what? A ram, an offering, a sacrifice. On that mount he has provided, Christ. Another way in which the gospel, we're having this flip-flop and this apostasy, is we deny the gospel by diminishing the uniqueness of Christ. Brothers, that is going to be, that is gonna be the battle of our lives as we grow older. You are going to see, it's already happening, you're going to see it, you're going to see maybe even the great majority of evangelicals are gonna deny the uniqueness of Christ. They're going to say, Christ is my savior. But they're not gonna say he is the savior. They're gonna say things like, who am I to judge? I can't judge others and what others believe, no. But for me, Jesus is my savior. That's apostasy. Listen, I could become the most popular preacher in America tomorrow. I could be on every liberal talk show, news program, and everything. All I have to do is change the definite article to an indefinite article. I have to stop saying Jesus is they, the Savior and start saying He is a Savior, and everyone will applaud me. You see, Christians were persecuted in the first centuries for being atheists. Did you know that? Because there, there was the land before them. There was the Roman Empire with thousands upon thousands of gods. 
And everyone was okay with everyone else's gods. They traded gods like they trade, like we would trade baseball cards when we were little kids. They affirmed one another. And then here comes the Christian. All your gods are vanity. They are not gods. And furthermore, Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is. Do you see that? We are going to see, I believe, a massive wave of apostasy. And here's what's gonna happen. When preachers like me will not give in on the day they throw my old body in jail, the great majority of evangelicals will stand up and say amen, we're tired of that preacher's hatred and intolerance. Don't you ever give in to that. You give in to that, my friend, you are not Christian. You are not Christian at all. Then another way, and this, this may hit some of you. When a church, and when I say church, I mean a local body of believers, when a church uses anything other than the gospel as a drawing card for the church, they're close to apostasy. Let me give you an example. I go to websites, I look up a church, I see a website. What's amazing to me? I see this photograph. It's so common of just a bunch of spectacularly beautiful people. With, I mean, they're beautiful. And they're all smiling and they're maybe hugging one another. And you hear things like a, a, an accepting, serving, kind community and invites you to join them or something like that. My first question is, I, I, I want to go to my pastor sometimes and ask him this question. How did they get all the beautiful people? Because our people are kind of ugly. <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, where'd they get all these beautiful people? And then the gospel is found on page 16 of the website a watered down, powerless version of what is written. Their drawing card is them. And you say, well, Brother Paul, what did Jesus say? You know, they would know we are Christians by our love. The apostles didn't walk around hugging one another as they walked into town. So don't take that text out of context. I was with Brother Conrad. He may not even remember this. We were in Romania together years and years ago. And he was preaching to our missionaries, and he said this. He said, do you want to know how the Apostle Paul started a church? He took a big billboard out, and he wrote upon it the most scandalous thing he could possibly write, we preach Christ crucified. And it was in that scandalous message that the power of God was manifested in the regeneration and redemption of men. Don't try to put a pretty worldly face on your church. Don't develop this idea that the cults frequently use that we're gonna soft sell the gospel, put the demands somewhere away in the back or the scandalous content somewhere in the back and gradually we'll move the people toward that. That's deception. Congratulations, you've just become much like these people described in verses one and two. We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. Now, in 56 seconds, what is the cure for this? Look at verse six. Young Timothy, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. What is our job? Just like a ship's captain at the pulpit. You keep that boat in the right direction. And what is that direction? Headed straight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Everything about your church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your proclamation begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ in living colors. In living colors. The gospel, the gospel. Nothing greater has ever been given to a creature. Nothing greater has ever been done by God. And is your palate so unrefined spiritually that you desire other things? Is your church's palate so unrefined because of your preaching that you have to entertain them or get them occupied in your vision so that they have some purpose? I really get sick and tired of men with all their visions. Pastor, the only vision you need is Christ crucified and raised from the dead. And then you simply obey him. You obey him and allow that obedience and the grace of God to take you where Christ wants you to go. Stop building your own kingdom. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do only what is written. Let's pray.